So let's talk about loops. Loops are a control structure in programming that allow you to execute a block of code repeatedly that might be based on certain conditions. They are fundamental to automating any repetitive task in a data structure. In Python, there are just two types of them, and then that's for loop and then while loop. So let's take them one after the other. A for loop uses a sequential form of data to determine the number of time it's going to execute a certain block of code. So let's see the syntax. So you start with your for, which is the keyword, and the next thing is your variable name that is going to identify each one of the item that you are transversing over. It can be a list, it can be a set, a dictionary, you know, it has to be a sequential form of data. Then you specify another keyword, which is in, in the sequence. So this is just the syntax. The next thing you terminate your for loop. So your, your column here terminates your for loop. Then you can go ahead and determine the statement that must be executed within the for loop. So here you can then have as many code as you want to be executed. So let's go ahead and check out how this can be, you know, done. So when you talk about sequence, what are sequence? Example of sequence can be range of data. And we have covered this in our previous class. We also talked about list, set, tuple, and dictionary. So these are what you can actually use your loop to iterate over. So we're going to start with um, a list just to be, you know, um, straightforward. We're going to use every other examples. So we can have a list that says list of one to five items. And um, I have list one, two, three, four, five. I can then replace my sequence with my items. This items is a variable that contains a list that I want to iterate over. And here I can have I as the variable that is going to hold individual item inside the sequence or inside the list in this case. Then my statement for now is just that I just want to print out each of the item here so that I can just see to make sure that this is working. So if I run this, for example, I have my item one to five being printed out. So irrespective of what is here, based on what is here, is going to determine what it is that is going to come out. So if I say hello, I'm going to have hello one, two, three, four, five. When you know what you are looking through, when you are looking over, it's kind of a giveaway to tell you that you are going to use for loop. But let's say you don't want to create a list because you want to loop one to five. There's another sequential data that we have, but it's not a data type. It's more of like a function. The job of the function is to create a range. And what range does is that it allows you to specify number of data that you can illustrate over. So instead of you using list one to five, you want to actually let the system generate one to whatever you want it to generate to. So let's say you want to range to one to five, just like we did list the other time. You could actually do range five here. And when you run it, you get this weird result. Yeah, even though it's starting from zero, it's still five items, but like it is, it starts from zero and it ends at four, but it's still five item. So what if you want it to have, you know, not looking weird, you want it to read one to five, normal, normal. So what you then need to do is that the range actually accepts some different kind of parameter. If you provide it with one parameter, it will only use that parameter as a stopping point. If you pass it two parameter, it will use one value, the first value as the startup parameter and uses the second value as the stopper. So imagine you start from one to five, look at what it's going to generate for you. It's going to start from one and end at five. Of course, it's not going to count the five for the reason because you did not start from zero. So what that means is if you really want to go to five, one to five, you then need to decide that your range should be one to six so that you have this view here, depending on what it is you want to do here. So let's just play with this value and just do something so that it will start making sense when I'm running this range again. So let's say we want to write a program to do a times table. And um, what I can just do here is to I already have my variable. I will change my variable name to now I just to make it a little bit shorter. And um, I want to be able to multiply these 
by let's say four so this will then be a four times table so i can say i can do a printout and say four times table then i can then write something like this and say four times i is equal to this so just form of an expression so four times table let me do so we now have four times table, four times one four four times two eight like that so that when I'm making adjustments, we'll just be having something better to look at than just running numbers. Okay, so what I wanted to do now is that um, I just explained that this is starting point. This is now where to stop. Testing one more thing. And the next one is kind of a stepper. So if you look at the definition, so you can either, you have a start part, which we have one. We have the stop, which we then say stop at six, which is going to stop at five. By the way, so there's like a minus one there. And then we have a step. Step is more of like skip a number. Like if you want it to be skipping every two, two or every three, three like that. So we can say skip two. By default, the skip is one. So that's why it can count. So if you say skip two, what do you expect? You will not see two, four and six in our result. So if you run this, we'll just have one, three, five. So if you say run this to 10, for example, so what do you expect? You will not be seeing two, um, four, six, and eight like that. And you can also do more steps, guys. You can add more steps. So you can do three, and then you have this weird result. Let's now do a real life example, guys, using this loop system. Let's say we want to sum all the even numbers, right? Uh, by the way, you already know how to generate even numbers from just this pretty example I've shown you. You should know how to do even numbers. If you start from zero and you say two, so these are even numbers. Okay, so let's now make this something that we can pass the value to. So let's clear this. Let's now write sum of all even numbers in, I want to be able to pass the value as n so that I can say n is equal to 12, for example, and I can have this change to n. Let's just say, how do we sum all the numbers? Let me just show you so that you see the results. So we have our i. Remember our i, we now hold our new even numbers. These are our even numbers, guys. 4, 2, 6, 8, 10. So you need to have a way to sum them up. Uh, let's create a variable to, you know, have our value that will be summing each other up. So let's call it total. Our total by default starts from 0. And um, let's start summing, guys. To sum... We will then do total plus equal to i. So this is like a shorthand. So you could do it this way. Total is equal to total plus i. Just to make it clear. So if you run this, at the end, you can print, at the end of your loop, you can see how I'm coming outside here that I'm done with my loop. At the end of my loop, I can then say total is equal to total. Then if we run this, we should see that if you sum all even numbers in 12, you should have 30. You can do something more crazy. Let me reduce this or let me make it more fun. Let's say if you say 1,200. Of course, the system is going to print all to 1,200 and then give you your total. But you can ignore all the printout. It should just give you your results and you can put crazy numbers, guys. You can test the power of Python or test the power of your system. So if you sum all the even numbers in this value, you have that value. So you can break your system by doing stuff. So you can see that the system is actually running. It's not giving my results. It took like forever to give me that result. So don't try crazy numbers. You can just break your system. Not that it's going to break by the way, but it's going to slow down your system. So let's move on to the next thing. So I'm going to give you guys assignments, guys. And the assignment is that find the sum of odd numbers. So the assignment that I'm going to give you guys is this. I'm going to give you two assignments. Find the sum of all odd numbers in a value. So you should be able to impute a value and then find the sum of all the odd numbers. That's using the for loop. So that's like a... A, you know a cheap one then using the for loop find all the prime numbers within a value 
So you should be able to impute like 20 and then you should print out all the prime numbers. So you know what prime are? Prime can only are only divisible by themselves. So let's go to the second thing that we have, which is a while loop. A while loop is used when you want to execute a block of code as long as a condition is true. So you want to execute a, a block of code when conditions are true. And how do you write syntax for a while loop? A while loop is like this. So while condition is true, what then happen? Then you can print some stuff here. So I'm going to write the same, you know, one to 10 or one to something. And um, what condition can you use to determine if something should run? So you can either specify, so I'm just going to do i is equal to zero to be like my counter because I want to do a condition that as long as i, you know, is a certain number or is less than a certain number, you know, print some things for me. So I'm going to say as long as i is less than 10, right, print i. But you know, if I run this condition now, this program will never end. It will what? Because i will always be less than 10. So you need a way for the program to get to a point that i will eventually be more than 10 or equal to 10. So how can you do that? Is by doing an incremental value, which is something like this. So with this code now, what do you think will happen? If I run this, the system will come to this part and then it will keep adding one to my eye. Once my eye gets to 10, this part will stop working. So this is a way to write one to 10 and it's the same thing like this value that we have for, I want to compare with the for loop now. So when you have for i, let me use x this time around, range 10 and then let's print out our results we print out x i'm gonna do the printout and call this while loop and call this other one for loop so you can see the code and enjoy so this while loop it gets here our for loop start this way so you can see the way for loop works i just need two line of code if you want to do the same range because this is like a range also kind of a thing but what it requires is that you need to do something which is called initialization. You need to initialize the variable that you will use for conditioning. So there's initialization part and there's also what? There's also the condition part. And there is another thing that we we'll call incrementing the initialized value. So you can see that this guy has a whole lot working for it. You need to have um, a part where you initialize the variable need to have the condition going and finally you then need to increment it so that this condition must end there's there's no condition that run infinite in an infinite loop you need to find a way to terminate your condition while for the four is straightforward you just loop over a series of what sequential value and you are done so let's see where this will be useful and i'm going to run a very robust example so that you will get the feel of what's going on so what I want to do now is to generate a random number. I want to do a game. I want to create a game. And that game is that we generate a number 1 to 10. And in that program, we are supposed to guess. Like we're supposed to guess what's the value. We will keep checking until our guess is correct. Our guessing is unlimited. So while we are wrong, you should keep writing the program. That's what we want to do. While we are wrong, so let me write the what is happening here write a python program using while loop to guess your answer keep guessing until you are correct Another thing, give clue to the user. So let's give the user a clue. So let's go ahead and write that code. My answer is, for now I can say my answer is nine. And then I can say my guess is equal to minus one. 
because I've not guessed yet. Then we can now see, well, our guess is not equal to, to our answer. What should happen? Keep asking the guy for the question. So what am I going to ask here? Let's collect the guess from the user. So we convert it to integer and we do an input. We say enter your guess value. So let's run this. So I've entered one. So you can see that is the code will never end until we guess nine that the program will end. So you say the program terminates immediately we enter nine, which is what we told the program to do. And um, we need to now make this a little bit of fun. How can you make it a little bit of fun? So let's say if guess, for example, if what the user guess is greater than the answer. So we can say too high. What about if the guess is less than the answer? Then we can say that's too low. So this way, the user know that, oh, okay, it's as if I'm guessing too high or I'm guessing too low. Then finally, what is the last option? Who can guess? The last option means that, you know, that's the correct answer. Because if it is too high and it's less than, then when you get it, it's equal to. So I can now say congratulations. And that's all. We've ended. So let's try the code now and see how it runs now. So this time around, let me put my answer to be 7. And let's run the program and see. So it says we should guess the value. So I try 1. It says too low, which is true. because uh, So let's try 10. Of course, it's going to say too high. So let's try 5. Of course, it's going to say too low. And so that means we should go a little bit up. So let's try 8. It will say too high. Oh, okay. Let's try 7. And we're expected to meet with congratulations. So I want to put one more spin to it. Let's, you know, tell the user how long you've been trying. So you can tell the user, oh, you've been trying this amount of times. So let's just say attempt. Attempt is zero. So every time the system asks you for the guess, we have attempt is equal to attempt plus one. So like a counter, I can say congratulations. You won after this attempt. Let's give it a try. This time around, let's say this is 10. And I'm going to try in the first attempt and see, you know, I want to win it first attempt. So if I say 10 is the answer, of course, it's going to say you won after one attempt. So let's try the answer being 3. And let's run it. And it's going to say 1, 2, 3. You won after 3 attempts. So that's fantastic, guys. And um, that gives you an idea how the while loop works. You see that the for loop will never work in this position because the for loop requires that you know the number of time you are going to illustrate into your code. But the while, you know, doesn't know. It's a kind of continuous thing. And you have to be able to, you know, have a condition that until that condition is met, before your program can actually branch out from your code or your program can finish. I'll give you guys an assignment here. So the assignment is simple and it's similar to this. Okay, so write a Python program that allows you to keep, remember the word I use keep, keep converting Nera to USD until you enter for quit you know so what that means is that if you enter um any any value convert and then you enter that number you enter the value like to 200 nera you know it will convert to us dollar for you so once you now press q the program will terminate based on the inputs that you put so normally the system should be asking you to convert the value you want to convert and once that is converted it will still ask you oh what do you want to convert again so the system will keep will be ready to answer what it is you want to do until you type in Q, which means you are done with the program. So that should be your assignment on that part. So let's move on to the next thing I want to also talk about. One other thing I want to capture is break and continue statement. Break statement when encounter in a loop, what it does is that it stops the looping sequence. Whatever that is doing, it stops it and jump out of the loop. 
So we will do our regular loop. So let's say loop from loop i in range 10. And let's go ahead and print our i. So this is pretty normal. So let's say if i is equal to 5. So break this loop. So for some reason, you want to break the loop when i is 5. So once you run this, look at what happened, guys. Whenever you are looping and then inside here, it checks that i is equal to 5. The system breaks like this and it breaks out of this loop and it goes ahead and continue your system. Let me put a print here and say other program. So other program is running here. Without this break, without this break, maybe I'll just print something here. Whenever it's 5, something will print here, right? Because that's what we did here. Whenever we have 5, print something. But this time around, whenever I get to 5, I don't want to continue the rest of this program again. I want to stop. I don't want it to count up to 9. There will be a reason why you want that. So if you don't want that to happen, you can actually say break. So for that purpose, I will just print out and say stop. So that way you see it, how it's stopping. So it says stop here. And when it stops, what happened? The program ends and jump out to where you have your print other program so other programs still continue to work so that's how break works so it's also a keyword and is used in your loop system the other part we have is the continue so when you encounter continue what happens with continue is that it keep the current illustrator what is going to happen is that instead of it stopping the entire program if you use the word continue continue is just going to skip number five so number five is not going to print out here. It's going to jump to number six. So I will use the word skip. So if I run this program, you will not see number five here in the program. So if something is supposed to happen to number five, it won't execute. So let's say you are trying to do I modulus. I modulus two, for example, is equal to zero. So you want it to always skip that. So this is a way for you to detect um even numbers for example you want something to happen on even numbers so you can see at every point that's how modulus work obviously at every point you have i mod 2 you have it's keeping what is supposed to happen if you have some calculation that you don't want to occur for this you can use that program to skip it and then you continue and this can be a way to also create a kind of um, step so you can see what i did there one three five seven nine i created the kind of step but remember that you could achieve this method with range we already did this before in the earlier uh, part of the video 